So it is uh, just after one o'clock. We'll call this meeting to order. This is the City Council, Library and Observatory Board, the Housing Authority Board, and the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency. This is our regular meeting th Thursday, June 18th, 2020, and it is just after 1 p.m. Uh, would you please stand uh, for the flag salute? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we uh, had a little glitch there, but uh, that was the flag salute. Uh, Good. If you uh, heard it, if you were on the phone, you uh, caught the back end of that. We uh, did. Okay, let's move on to the roll call. Council Member Kite. Here. Council Member Smotrich. Here. Council Member Townsend. Here. Mayor Pro Tim Weil. Here. And Mayor Hobart. Here. Great. Thank you, Christy. All right. Uh, now we'll move on to non-agenda public comment. Uh, this is an opportunity for a member of the public to speak on an issue that is not on our agenda for a maximum of three minutes. If you are participating by phone, uh, you may make a non-agenda public comment now by pressing star nine on your telephone. Once again, you would press star nine on your telephone. Before we move to those on the phone, uh, is there anyone here in person that would like to make a non-agenda public comment? You can come forward now. Okay, seeing so no one here in person, we will move back to uh, the telephone, and we do have uh, one person that would like to make a non-agenda public comment, and that is uh, Mr. Brad Anderson. Uh, go ahead, Brad, we can hear you. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Brad Anderson. I live in the city of Ranch Mirage. I wanted to uh, just uh, mention, uh, hopefully, uh, at today's meeting that the uh, city manager, which is a trustee that sits on the Coachella Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District, will make some kind of Speak up, comment. please. I'm sorry, who was that? Can you speak a little louder, Brad? Oh, yeah, you're good. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, uh, my name's Brad Anderson. I live in the city of Ranch Mirage. Uh, I was hoping that today that the uh, city manager that uh, is a trustee on the Coachella Valley Mosquito and Vector Control District will make some kind of public comment concerning the uh, the activities of that district and the uh, tragic events that uh, arose out that there uh, this past last week. And I'm, I'm very concerned because that, that's a public entity and it's not performing its duties to the uh, citizens of the valley. And, uh, and when detestants are discovered with West Nile and St. Louis encephalitis and, and, uh, and viruses such as those, uh, the cities and the residents need to be informed of that. And, uh, and if necessary, I would like to see an external um, agency come in and uh, take over those duties if, if the vector control district are not willing or not able to perform those. And I hope that uh, some comments or public comments will be said about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to make a public comment? You would do so by pressing star nine on your telephone now. Okay, uh, seeing no one else, we will close that portion of the meeting and move on to council member comments. And so, council member Kite. Yes, thank you, no comment today. Great, council member Smotrich. No comment today. Council member Townsend. Three for zero. <laughs> All right. Mayor Try Pro for four. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem Weil. No comment. Thank you. Mayor Hobart. Uh, just a brief comment. I'd like to applaud the uh, United States Supreme Court for its 6-3 to three decision holding it illegal to terminate the employment of gays, lesbians, uh, because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. It was the right decision, but long in coming. I agree. Wonderful move. And one that wasn't expected either, Dana. Yeah, quite right. Yeah.
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we will now move on to city manager comments. Uh, so uh, I do have a, a couple comments today. Uh, the first one is uh, we have our building official, Jack Merchell, here in the audience, and he's going to come up in a minute. But I wanted to take a minute to uh, recognize Jack after uh, 16 years of service. As a director. After 16 years of service to the city of Rancho Mirage, uh, Jack is retiring and moving on to the uh, next phase of his life. Uh, although we're very happy for Jack and <clears throat> being able to retire, we are gonna be very sad that he is leaving our organization. Uh, Jack has uh, been with the city for 16 years. Uh, he worked his way all the way up to the building official, which is the top uh, position in his division. Jack has been our city building official since 2016. Uh, as the city's building official, he takes on a lot of responsibility for the development uh, that happens in Rancho Mirage, and he makes sure that everything is up to code and built uh, the right way. Uh, Jack, uh, during his time here at the city, has been involved in uh, the biggest projects that we've had, all the way down to single family home developments and uh, some of the uh, more notable projects that uh, Jack has overseen has been uh, the numerous expansions of Desert European, uh, the Ranch Mirage Library and Observatory uh, being built. Uh, the uh, Ritz-Carlton uh, was another major project, the rehab of the Rancho Las Palmas Shopping Center. And uh, I think uh, where Jack has had the most influence is on the uh, Eisenhower Health Campus. Uh, Jack has uh, been out there and been our expert uh, for the numerous developments and expansions that have happened on that campus. And uh, he is leaving some uh, very big shoes for us to fill. Uh, so Jack, uh, just thank you for your years of service to the city. Thank you for the expertise that uh, you brought into the process and the professionalism and the uh, timely response and compassion that you showed the uh, development community during your time here. You uh, definitely uh, set the bar very high and we really appreciate all your efforts. Uh, so would you like to come up and uh, make a, a few comments? Jack Merchel. Uh, uh, Isaiah, while Jack is coming up to the uh, uh, podium, I'd like to, this is Mayor Pro Tem Ted Weil, I'd like to personally thank Jack for his service. He has been extremely helpful and informative uh, to me over the years, uh, keeping me up to date on the status of the various projects, what has to be done, uh, what is uh, lacking, uh, and so forth. He's just uh, been a, a wealth of information, extremely accessible, and just a pleasure to work with. From a personal standpoint, Jack, I cannot wish you anything but Godspeed ahead. Thanks, Jack. And Ted, let me let me dovetail off of you with Jack. Ditto, ditto. He has always been there for me, bent over backwards, jumped in a car and, and drove and answered questions that I had on different issues. And he will be greatly missed. And also, Jack, you're too young to retire. <laughs> but thank you. Jack, this is Richard Kite, and it's been a great 16 years working with you. You certainly made the city a better place to live, and we'll all miss you. So good luck in the future, though. Okay, and Jack, if I might say a few words also, this is Iris. And I want to thank you particularly for all the effort that you have put forth over these years, always reaching out to our residents, and the people who have called to get your advice. You've always been so prompt in obtaining whatever information is necessary to their issues, and it has always been appreciated. I've gotten many, many thank yous on your behalf, and you have really uh, made our city shine beautifully when it comes to staying on top of issues that might be troubling to our residents and our businesses. And uh, as I echo with Charlie that you are a little bit young to retire, but I know that your next chapter is going to be fruitful, enjoyable, and very rewarding in every way. So I wish you all the very best from I, me and from Tom. 
Thank you. We will miss you. And Jack, this is Dana Hobart. We thank you uh, on behalf of the city uh, for all you've done. Uh, you're not going to be an easy person to replace. Plus, we're going to miss you like mad. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I came to the city in 2004 as an established contractor, but very green inspector. The city has provided mentoring, security, and opportunities to involve with projects I never even imagined. In my 16 years at Rancho Mirage, I have been blessed beyond measure. I have never in my 62 plus years worked with a finer group of individuals, and my heartfelt thanks go out to all the city. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Congratulations. Isaiah, when is that? when's Jack leaving? What's the timetable? End of the month. He's got a, about a week left. <laughs> oh, boy, oh boy. Oh, good. Thank you. This is his uh, final council meeting. So. Wow. All right. Uh, You'll probably want to attend all the future ones, though, in person, so I am sure. I, I bet that's on the top of his retirement list. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Uh, and then the uh, second item that I'll uh, speak on is, uh, so the city council uh, appointed me to the uh, vector control district board. And so I represent the city on that board. And uh, the vector control district uh, does a great job for our valley and protecting public health. Uh, they have uh, their, their own separate special district. And uh, they have their own uh, public information officer with their own communication platform and uh, their testing facilities are amazing. Uh, so when I first got on the board, uh, I was given a tour of the facility and, and really to see, uh, you know, you think of mosquitoes or you think of fire ants and, uh, you know, you don't really think of science, but uh, this facility and that staff over there does great work uh, and the process that they go through to test mosquitoes uh, is amazing. Uh, they use science, they use data, um, and they have all the testing equipment right there so that they can turn around results quickly and immediately start applicating, applying application to areas. Uh, so they do a great job over there in protecting us uh, from mosquitoes and the viruses that those mosquitoes can carry. Uh, they also, in recent years, have really stepped up their public communication uh, process. And so when they detect uh, mosquitoes with West Nile, uh, as an example, uh, they immediately start communicating with the jurisdictions. So as the government entity, if, if uh, uh, a mosquito is found in, in our city, they, they notify the government organization, and then they immediately start uh, communicating uh, via multiple platforms. Uh, when they're going to uh, apply their application in areas based on uh, what they're seeing in the mosquito population, uh, they can they uh, target uh, those neighborhoods for their communication. And they've, in fact, recently started using Facebook. And so they use geofencing on Facebook if they're going to go into a neighborhood uh, or into a community. And uh, when you open up your Facebook account, if you're within that geofence, you will see their uh, communication about the application that they're gonna be doing in your neighborhood. Uh, so the district does uh, uh, great work. Um, I think as we all saw in the Desert Sun recently, um, just like the rest of us, um, we, uh, they are essential workers and their work has continued through the pandemic, thankfully. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, very sad news came out of the district this last week that uh, one of their employees died uh, from COVID-19. And uh, being that, um, you know, their employees, their job function, you know, they can't always social distance. And so they've taken all the appropriate uh, precautions per the CDC guidelines and the state guidelines on what you need to do in an office space. Uh, but. Uh, they did have uh, several employees uh, also test positive for uh, COVID-19. And so mm -hmm. they had to follow the procedures that every other business has to follow and every other government is following where they uh, had to close down their facility. Uh, all their staff had to go get tested um, and they had to uh, deep clean their facility. 
Uh, and then uh, as staff are awaiting their test results, they are having to quarantine at home. And so the district offices are currently closed right now due to uh, COVID-19. But the district and their general manager has responded appropriately uh, to that situation. And it is just a, a very tragic uh, set of circumstances that one of their employees uh, did pass away from COVID-19. So. As we'll talk about later, it's a, uh, a reminder for all of us to remain vigilant and uh, continue to wear our face coverings uh, and do our part to help stop the spread of COVID-19. So I definitely do wanna thank the district for all they do to protect public health here in the Valley and even during this crisis. And our uh, hearts and thoughts go out to them during this very difficult time of them losing one of their team members. Isaiah, this is Dan. I'd like to add a tagline to it. For people who have uh, red imported fire ants in your yard from time to time that can cause considerable injury to pets, not to mention to yourself if you've ever been bitten by one, uh, all you have to do is call them and uh, they will line up uh, experts to come out and to treat the, um, uh, the areas where the red imported fire ants are showing themselves and um, they're saving some, a lot of dogs, a lot of people, some really bad bites, and I uh, appreciate uh, the work that uh, they do in that field. Dana, thank you. I never knew about the fire ants that they did that. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah that's good. And good it costs news. nothing. It costs nothing yeah, wow. to have them come out and good. treat it. Good. Yeah, it's a great uh, free service that they provide to the entire Coachella Valley. Uh, Charlie. Has yeah. Being on the HOA board, what happens is the various HOAs uh, set a uh, date uh -huh. uh, with the vector control to come out and do the entire subdivision when during the red ant period. And so okay. your HOA can coordinate a time with them. I, w I will do that. I did not know that. Thank you, Ted. Sure. Okay, and that uh, concludes my city manager comments. Thank you for that opportunity. Uh, so we will move on to the minutes. So we have the June 4th, 2020 regular meeting minutes. Move approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Christy, will you please do the roll call vote? Council Member Kite? Yes. Council Member Smotrich? Yes. Council Member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Christy. We will now move on to the consent calendar, uh, which I will summarize. So uh, Mr. Mayor, member of the city, members of the city council, we have only three items on our consent calendar for your consideration today. Uh, item number one is the adoption of a resolution uh, establishing the appropriations limit for the fiscal year 2020-2021 in accordance with the provisions of division nine of Title I of the California Government Code. Item number two are contracts, and many of our annual contracts are on this list. Staff is uh, pulling uh, contract number 14 on the list, which is the contract with the Chamber of Commerce that's not quite ready yet for the council's consideration. We will bring that contract back at our next regular city council meeting. So we are pulling contract number 14. Mr. City list. Manager, would you also pull item number 2-25, which is the Frank Sinatra Bridge? Yes. Uh, and then item number three are demands. And before I move to uh, council comments or questions, let's move on to public comment. So if any member of the public would like to speak on one of these three items, now is the time to do so. If you are on the phone, uh, you can press star nine to talk on these items and we'll move to those that are here in person. Is there any member of the public that is here in the chamber that would like to speak on the consent calendar? Seeing none, we will go back to the telephone. Again, star nine on your telephone if you would like to make a public comment on the consent calendar. Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll close the public comment period and uh, turn it over to uh, council questions or comments. Uh, this is Richard Kite, and I'd just like to uh, make a comment on item 
2-25 Frank Sinatra Bridge. Uh, for those of you who looked over the details, you'll know that this continues to be one of our priority projects. And because of that, I've asked the, uh, the director of public works, that's Jesse Akinroff, to give us a more detailed explanation as to what the current status of the bridge is and a little bit of, about the timing and the future cost. So, Jesse, are you here? Yes, I am. Uh, great idea. Uh, great time to give an update on the bridge. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, oh, sure yeah. enough. Okay. Uh, so the Rancher Mirage engineering team has been actively pursuing the development of the bridge, and the design process of the, br of the bridge is again in full swing. Uh, while the city was developing channel mitigation measures to satisfy CVWD's new requirements, uh, the bridge design was on hold. Uh, but recently a milestone was reached in the bridge development, and that milestone was a conceptual approval from CVWD on the grade control structure that CVWD required the city to construct. So once we pass, uh, move past the conceptual approval from CVWD, we have now uh, re-engaged uh, uh, our plan and design team, our engineering team, uh, to be moving forward with the project plans. Uh, the project plans are built around that grade control structure, so the two had to work in concert, but we are back in full swing on the bridge design. Uh, and due to CVWD's new requirement for a grade control structure, uh, there was a couple things the city has to do. So one is we have to acquire additional funding. And city staff have already submitted a uh, request to Caltrans to increase the participating cost from 39 million to 52.8 million for the bridge. Um, as part of the Caltrans review requirements, the city sent almost 500 pages of documentation to support that request for the additional funding. Uh, I believe it was early April when I submitted that to Caltrans, and I anticipate they will be reviewing that for another couple of months before we hear from them. Uh, but while that is going on, we are moving forward. Uh, the newly required grade control structure has a footprint that exceeds a half of an acre. Uh, so now we have to get a standalone permit from the Army Corps of Engineers, and we are performing concurrently, we are, we are also performing an environmental revalidation of the project. Um, so that's happening right now, and the city and AECOM, AECOM is our design uh, professional team. Uh, we met with Caltrans to get a consensus on the revalidation process, so we basically created a checklist of everything that Caltrans is going to look for and require from us. Uh, we were, luckily, we were able to get a biologist in the channel already to start that process. It has to be done in the springtime because that's when the plants are blooming. So we were able to work with CVWD and the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs to get permitting uh, to get in there. Our consultant has already went in there and started that work. Uh, so that is the environmental revalidation is in full swing as well. Uh, in addition to that, we are redesigning the plans, as I mentioned, uh, which are incorporating the newly required grade control structure. And the city is also uh, asking for a additional sidewalk on the south side of the bridge to connect Wolfson Park to the um, all the way up to the sidewalk on Highway 111. Um, so we are uh, working with our design team to incorporate that, uh, and we're developing a new project scope to include the sidewalk, the grade control structure, and some other minor um, developmental changes, and we're updating the schedule. Uh, while it's difficult on a project like this to determine an exact start date because you work with uh, multiple agencies like the Coachella Valley Water District, Caltrans, um, it's, it's difficult to, to pinpoint an exact date, but we have developed a schedule and we just updated it this week. And the schedule, best case scenario shows construction starting in the summer of 2020. Um, if we experience delays or condemnation issues, then that will get pushed out further. Uh, but that is uh, just all the steps that we have to take to hit a milestone. Uh, I'm sorry, summer of 2022, I'm sorry. Oh, 22. Yeah, summer of 2022. Oh. So that, that is the permitting process through the Army Corps of Engineers. That is finishing the design. Um, that is right-of-way acquisition, um, going out to bid, uh, awarding the project. So, um, you know, like the funding request that we just turned in, we can expect a three to six month 
uh, delay just to just to hear an answer from Caltrans whether that's approved or not. So there's some pretty pretty I mean major dollars involved with this project, uh, and so it takes some time to get through the the uh, process. So this proposed contract amendment with AECOM serves two critical funding needs. Uh, one was for the request from CVWD for a 2D model of the water flow through the bridge and proposed uh, grade control structure post construction. And two, it's to meet the requirements from Caltrans for the extra work required in the revi uh, environmental revalidation. Uh, so that's the update uh, as of now. And if there's any questions the council has, I'd be happy to answer them. Excellent update, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. Yeah, yeah thank you, Jesse. When, when this does start, is this still a build out of two years or more when they started? Yes, it is. So because we don't have an alternate route around Frank Sinatra, uh, we are going to have to keep Frank Sinatra open. So right now we're designing a set of plans to actually in widen Frank Sinatra Drive so that when we build half of the bridge, we still, yeah. the residents and emergency services still have half of a roadway. So it'll be direction, uh, you know, one way. It'll be a one lane each way. Uh, so we basically have to build half the bridge, stop, move to the other side yeah. of the road, and build the other half of the bridge. Um, yeah. So the process is probably going to be 9 to 12 months for each side. And it, there's just a lot of coordination with CVWD, uh, with the roadway, and, and doing it in two pieces because we need to keep the roadway open. Uh, so, yeah, two, two years is probably an appropriate time frame given the structure of how we have to build this bridge. Uh, Jesse, is the pandemic anything to do with holding this up or delaying it? Are they at full staff, or is this just the way it's going? Um, Caltrans, uh, they're working remotely, but they still are working. Um, yeah. COVID-19 has definitely, I think, just across the board, slowed, it has everything is slowing down a bit because everyone's having to adjust to working from home. Uh, but we are still pushing through with our consultant. We have uh, biweekly meetings. We just do them remotely. Uh, we submit most all of our paperwork now electronically. Um, so uh, I haven't seen a major slowdown in the process. Um, there's been an adjustment, but we're still moving forward. Very good. Thank you. Very good. And I just want to add my thank you to you, Jesse. I know this has been at the forefront for a long time. It has never been put on a back burner, but there have been uh, so many hurdles that you've had to tackle through the last couple of years. And the presentation you made about a year and a half ago was quite remarkable, but having these updates just brings it more into focus with what we have to, uh, the efforts we have to put forth just to make it happen. So thank you again for all you're doing and all your team is doing. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. If there are no other uh, questions or comments on the consent calendar, uh, now would be a time for a motion from the council. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar. I'll second it. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Christy, will you do the roll call vote? Certainly. Council member Kite? Yes. Council member Smotrich? Yes. Council member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Christy. Uh, we'll now move on to uh, reports and informational items. And uh, we will have an update on our, li our library. And uh, that has recently opened to the public with modification. And then also, here's some news about our summer reading program. So, Aaron, take it away. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council, and City staff. Before I start with the Summer Reading Club, I'd like to give you a brief update on the reopening of the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. We reopened our doors on March 9th in a library-to-go model. Let's take a look at the video we produced announcing our reopening. As a director of the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory, I'm happy to let you know that we are now reopening to the public and have taken steps to maximize your safety while providing access to library materials. When you visit, you'll notice several important changes as we operate our new library to go model. Upon arriving, guests will be guided into an air-conditioned queue line when necessary to ensure proper social distancing takes place within the building. 
Please follow staff's directions as they will be working to get you safely through the facility and on your way with your materials as quickly as possible. All returns should be made via our convenient drive through book drop or to the return cart at the front door upon entering the building. Under our to-go model, patrons will be able to select materials throughout the facility. However, no tables or chairs will be available. Although the children's play area and computer lab are closed, library staff will be happy to assist you with anything you might need. If you think you will need help, we highly encourage you to contact us before arriving by phone or email, as our reference librarians will be happy to assist you in finding materials and placing holds for pickup. When you are ready to check out the materials you've selected or placed on hold, use the markings and signage throughout to help you line up while keeping a safe distance from others. On your visit, please be sure to follow all guidelines to help prevent the spread of germs. All who enter the library and observatory are required to wear a face mask covering. Our hardworking staff and your fellow library patrons, thank you for doing all you can to help keep our community healthy. We look forward to seeing you. For the record, the dog was not part of that. <laughs> speak, for your, speak for yourself. <laughs> Whose dog was that? <laughs> Whose dogs? Who's, uh, is there a dog in, in the, in the whole morning? house? They, they, they heard that there was somebody invading City Hall, and uh, they were trying to alert you. Well, we're, see, they're, they're, you trained them well. <laughs> hey, Aaron, are, are we the front runners in the Coachella Valley for being the only library to open first? Uh, we are the first one to open our doors to allow patrons to come in and uh, browse. Uh, Palm Springs Library did start a curbside service uh, about a week prior to us. Very good. Any response? You want to tell them how many people are going in there a day approximately? Uh, yeah, if I can go ahead and continue with the presentation, I'll go ahead and get that information. Well, you sure may. All right. So I am happy to report that we have had a smooth reopening with many of our patrons thanking us for reopening and expressing their need for our library. With the new modified hours of Tuesday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. with the midday cleaning from 12 to 1.30, Tuesdays are our busiest days so far with approximately 260 patrons coming in with the rest of the week averaging about 142 per patrons a day. To date, the maximum number of patrons in a building at one given time has been 15. I want to thank the city council, city manager, and city staff who helped us open safely to our patrons. Our patrons continue to serve the community effectively and efficiently in these unprecedented times. In addition to serving our community with library materials, the library and observatory has always been known for our high quality of programs for all ages. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, We've had to cancel our in-person programs until it is safe to do so. Every summer for the past 25 years, the Rancho Mirage Library has put on the Summer Reading Club, focused on encouraging children to read throughout the summer and prevent what teachers like to call the summer slide. I'm happy to announce that starting on June 23rd, we will be holding our Summer Reading Club. This eight-week program will run from June 23rd through August 28th, for the first time in our history, the Summer Reading Club will be held virtually. This means that our programs and registration will be done online. Instead of me telling you how the Summer Reading Club will work, I'd like to show you a video we will be sending out next week. Hi everyone, I'm Valentine, the Children's Librarian at the Ranch Marge Library and Observatory. And today I'm here to tell you about our Summer Reading Club. This year, we wanted to focus our theme around our amazing national parks and national monuments, which means we'll be reading across America. We have made kits for your parents and caregivers to pick up at the library to follow along with us. We will be making the crafts on video, so make sure to follow us on email lists, Facebook, and YouTube so you don't miss any of the action. Each week's kits will be prepared by our staff wearing gloves and masks. In addition, the kits will sit in quarantine for at least 72 hours once completely prepared. In each kit, you will find all craft activities for you to complete during the week. An activity packet full of facts, brain teasers, mazes, crosswords for you to complete. You'll also find a secret code you'll need to use to get your completed badge on our virtual summer reading log on Beanstack. And that's it. I hope you follow along with us and have fun at home. Let's say hi to some familiar faces and our newest staff member. Reading Across America is starting next week and we hope you're as excited as we are. Hi, it's June from the Children's Department. I'm really excited about our Summer Reading Club. I sure hope everybody signs up. 
Hi, it's Marnie. Welcome back. I'm so excited to see all of you. See you soon. Hi, I'm Angelina. I'm the new library assistant right here in the children's room. I also want to take the time to thank our generous sponsor, the Brian and Patricia A. Herman Fund, for their continued support of our summer reading club. And with that, I want to say thank you, and we're happy to be back. So as previously mentioned a bit earlier and in the video, we will be using Beanstack this year. With special thanks to the State of California Library, the cost of Beanstack has been covered by a grant. Over the course of the last few years, we've tried to emphasize the participation of all patrons, regardless of age. By taking the Summer Reading Club online this year, it will allow us to encourage much more than reading by providing challenges at every age level to explore the city's opportunities, take virtual tours of museums and zoos, and much more. The more engaged a patron becomes, the more tickets they earn for many fabulous prizes at the end of the Summer Reading Club. Like the structure we've had in the past few years, patrons will be rewarded for hitting their reading goals, which are ba based on the participant's age. Also in keeping line with the past, we are providing STEAM and arts and crafts, which participants can stop by weekly to pick up the supplies. These supplies have been provided with the generous support of the uh, Brian and Patricia A. Herman Fund, who have fully supported the Summer Reading Club for the past four years. The COVID pandemic has greatly affected how everyone operates. But with the city council, city manager, and city staff's assistance, the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory will continue to thrive in serving our community and fulfill our mission of lifelong learning and access to all. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Very good. Aaron, I have a question. Are we accepting book donations? Uh, not at this time we are not. Uh, that will come in our uh, subsequent phases when the time is right. Thank you. Aaron, what kind of a program are we going to have to notify the public what's available? <clears throat> uh, we have sent out e-blasts and a press release, um, as well as uh, Facebook uh, uh, social media presence. Um, and so we, we've gone about our, our normal uh, methods. Okay, thank you. Great work. Aaron, tell Valentine she continues to do a great job in the in the library. We'll do so, thank you. Thank you, Aaron, and uh, thank you to everyone over at the library who has done an amazing job putting this program together and uh, really getting creative and being able to deliver the summer reading program in a safe way. So thank you, Aaron, and thank you to the staff. Okay, uh, we will now move on. Uh, I guess uh, uh, before we, uh, are there any members of the public that would like to speak on this item? Uh, if you're on the phone, you can press star nine. Uh, go to those that are here in person, seeing no one. Returning back to the phone, nobody there. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on. So we will move on now to our public hearings. So item number five on our agenda is a resolution uh, establishing our trash rates. And this staff report is going to be given by Tiana McAmel, our senior management analyst. Uh, Tiana. So Tiana's still on mute, guys. Just one moment while we bring uh, Tiana on. Okay, uh, Tiana, you need to unmute yourself on Zoom. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? We got gotcha. you. Yes. yes, we can. We still aren't able to see your PowerPoint, Tiana. There it is. We did get the hard copy. <clears throat> yeah, we did. Yeah, we're uh, showing it here in the council chamber as well. Oh, okay. Very good, on Zoom. <laughs> uh, Tiana, are you there?
can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Right now. Okay. So this rate adjustment will include two components. The first being an annual update of the fees to set rates for the coming fiscal year based on the BIRTEC contract, which is comprised of a collection fee, a disposal fee, and an annual reconciliation of actual disposal costs. The second component of the rate adjustment is a result of Senate Bill 1383, which is state mandated. Table one on the screen summarizes the proposed changes in the residential rate for an individual residence with twice a week walk-in service. Adding the increase for both the collection and disposal components increases the new residential rate by 60 cents from $19.39 a month to $19.99 a month. This constitutes the adjustment for component one. Component two is relative to SB 1383, a state mandate which builds upon California's leading commitments to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution statewide. SB 1383 sets aggressive organic waste reduction targets with the main component being the implementation of organic waste collection services to all residents and businesses. For those who are unaware, organic waste is classified as green waste or food waste. For the city of Rancho Mirage, this means ensuring all residents have the appropriate trash bins and trash service to collect organic waste. As shown on the screen, the state has mandated all trash bins follow the prescribed colors. Trash, any shade of gray or black, recycle, blue, organic waste, green. Currently, Rancho Mirage residents have various colors for their trash bins, gray recycle bins, and no organic waste bins. To remain compliant with state law, we must outfit residential customers with bins that follow the prescribed colors, so it's necessary to order blue residential recycle bins and green residential organic waste bins. To save residents money, residents will utilize their current gray recycle bins as their new trash bins beginning mid to late 2021. A compounding effect of introducing a third bin for organic waste is the need for additional hauler trucks to collect that waste. The rate increase relative to SB 1383 will start to cover the costs associated with the purchase of new trash bins and the additional trucks needed to service residential customers for the collection of organic waste. Table two on the screen summarizes a breakdown of the cost of the new color bins and additional trucks. The cost on the screen is $2.78 per household per month. Table three on the screen summarizes the added increase for both the collection and disposal components of the rates, along with the increase associated with state mandated SB 1383. The new residential rate will increase from the current $19.39 a month to $22.77 a month for an individual residence with twice a week walk-in service. Commercial rates are also increasing at a rate between two and 3% based on the service of the individual customer. Based on the information in the staff report, staff recommends that the city council approve the annual rate adjustment. That concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions and Mr. Orlett, vice president at Burtec is also on the line to answer questions. Thank you. Yeah, Tiana, this is Charlie. I have a question. Right now, we have three uh, waste pens that we put gardening trash and trash into it, and then we have the one recycle. Uh, I have been asked to ask the question, the recycling or the three waste baskets that we have now for people that work in their yard and do their own gardening. Is this going to be reduced to one, or will they still have maximum of three of those along with the recycling and along with the uh, other item that is there, which is in blue. Okay, so right now residents do not have the organic green, so they're going to gain an organic green waste bin, which they can put their yard waste in. And currently in the monthly rate, you can have up to four bins um, at no additional cost. So you can continue to have the amount that you have now. Okay, so they're not being reduced. Correct, they're not being reduced. And the sizes will be a little larger? Yes, the sizes will be a little larger. Currently you have a 32 gallon bin right. and it'll be 35 gallon bins, which was the most cost effective. Very good, and these will be supplied by BirdTech and these will have the lids, automatic closure lids on them, right? Correct. Thank you. Thank you. You are welcome. All right, uh, thank you, Tiana. Um, let's go ahead and open the public hearing.
so if you are on the phone and you would like to speak on this item, uh, you may do so now by pressing star nine on your telephone. Once again, that's star nine. Uh, we'll move to anyone here uh, in the chamber in person. Is there anyone here that would like to make a comment? Seeing none, uh, we will go back to the telephone. Again, you would press star nine. All right, I'm not seeing anyone on the telephone either that would like to uh, speak on this item. So we'll close the public hearing and I will return back to the council for any additional questions or comments. Question for Tiana. Tiana, uh, what is the schedule again for the implementation of the various fee changes? I'm sorry, could you repeat of the various what? Fee changes. Okay, so this is the first fee change that we're seeing for, in relation to SB 1383. The next one that's going to be brought to council is going to be in January of 2021 in conjunction with the new Burtec contract. And then we'll continue on as we normally do and have a regular annual rate adjustment in June of 2021. Okay, hey, thank you. Yeah, this is uh, Dana Hobart. Uh, with respect to the black um, box, is that going to be the same size as the box that we've got now? Well, right now you have 32 gallons, so it'll be a little bit bigger because it's going to be 35 gallons. Okay. If And the um, organic waste, that's 32, I assume? The organic waste will be a 35 gallon. Also 35. And the recycled then, how, is that a 32 or 35? That will be a 35. So mm -hmm. you're going to see consistent in our community 35 gallon uh, trash bins, recycle bins, and organic waste with all consistent colors. Okay. And will trash pickup continue to be twice a week or will there be any modification of that? No, twice pickup will continue to be twice a week. Okay. Thank you, Tiana. You're welcome. Are there uh, any other questions at this point? Uh, I would like to just uh, take a second to uh, thank Frank Orlett uh, from Burtec and his entire staff. Uh, as all of us know that uh, live in Rancho Mirage, Burtec does a fantastic job uh, for our community. And uh, so with this change, uh, it's really being, um, you know, what prompted this change is state law. And so, uh, the process that we went through with BirdTech was to try to make it as easy as possible on our residents. So our commercial already has organic recycling in place now. Uh, so really this is impacting uh, the residential customer. And uh, so we're keeping our uh, walk-in service. And uh, much like we have it now, your, your trash gets picked up twice a week. And then your recycle bin gets picked up once a week. So what we've worked out with BirdTech is uh, on one trash pickup day, you'll see trash and organics. And then on the second trash pickup day, you'll have trash and recycling. Uh, so we're uh, starting to work on our uh, communication uh, platform with how do we start to communicate the impacts of this. Uh, it will be effective in January of next year and so more movement will start to happen. What's being built into the rate right now are the capital costs. So the cost of those bins and the cost of the, the new trash trucks to pick up the organics. We have to purchase those and get them uh, uh, deployed, uh, obviously, before we can start providing the service. And so there will be more conversations uh, later on by the council with the rates will have to be adjusted again later once we start to add the bodies that are actually gonna uh, man the route and pick up the organics. So that will require another rate adjustment early next year. Uh, early next year, you'll also see the delivery of these bins. So we do have quite a bit of work ahead of us from a cu customer communication standpoint. And we are obviously working with Burtech uh, and we're gonna start to uh, work on our public communication platform just to notify people of what's going on and, and, and why is it changing. We do recognize that we do have some communities out there that have um, built in uh, trash bin holders. And so this could be a challenge for some of those communities where they were built uh, to only hold uh, two bins. 
so we are working on our uh, public communication effort of how we really start to communicate yeah. out, but we do have some time and really what we're doing right now is getting prepared with the necessary equipment uh, and with a lot more work to do on this as we continue to go through the year and get closer to next year. So Frank, thank you to your- Can I, your can I, ask, uh, can I ask Frank a question? Yep. Um, Mr. Orlett, Frank, how are you? This is Dana Hobart. Uh, my best to your wife, by the way. Um, Frank, uh, when pickup starts, suppose somebody has uh, two black trash buckets that are out to be picked up. Will they both continue to be picked up like they are now, or are we limited to uh, one? No, I'm a mayor, a member of the council, Frank Orlett, uh from Burtek Waste and Recycling Services. They'll be able to pick up multiple containers. It depends on how many they want. Um, it won't necessarily be a black container. Or the trash container is going to be uh, gray, actually. The current recycling container is going to be the trash container uh, when we implement the program. But if they want multiple containers, whether it's green waste and food waste container or recycling container, uh, that will be available to them. You, you notice as you go around the town, um, some people have the regular trash bin that you provide them. Some people have bought trash bins that are yeah. similar but not identical. Yeah. And some people have like little round bins that they use for trash pickup. Uh, will your folks continue to pick up those uh, regular trash bins um, regardless, as long as they have at least one is the official one, uh, will they continue to pick up the two or three that sometimes are out there? Once we implement the program, we'll, um, the, the, bins will, the, the gray bins will go trash. The current uh, customer trash cans um, will be either, the customer will either be able to take them and use them for something else or we can, we'll take them away at no charge and dispose of them. But, but because, of the, because of the state regulations, it has to be uniform on the three colors and the three types. Okay. I think that'll be an important thing for residents to, um, to learn as we move closer to trash day with the new bins. Frank, this is Richard. Uh, the program looks great. Uh, it's good for certainly the residents. When will they start to uh, get the new cans? Uh, sometime, sometime probably in the first quarter, Richard, or maybe maybe closer to the second quarter once we finalize the agreement. Implementation and communication. Communication is going to be critical for us and for the city to be successful. So that's going to be the biggest piece. Um, implementing and, and delivering the, the cans are really the easy part, to be honest with you. Yeah. Uh, Frank, this is Charles Townsend. Question. Right now, at my home, I have three of the gray small 31 or 32 bins and then I have the one recycle. What will be the total number when you get to this at the house? Will it still be four and is that the limit? And going back to what Dana's asking, if we had another, if we kept a couple of those old gray Burtek ones, the little ones for, for weeds and yard work, will that be picked up or is everybody getting cut off to just three or four, are we losing one? Is my point. Um, so I don't think so. Frank, right. Frank, do you mind if I just jump in real quick? Uh, sure. So Charlie, uh, we're adding an organics bin, and so the point of that is, you don't put your yard clippings in the trash anymore. You put it in the organics bin. That's why you're getting the organics bin. Uh, okay, so, but the organic bin that we have, we got three of them, and you, other people have asked me, you don't have what an, happened? You don't have an organic bin right now. Uh, well, that, let me say, let me say the adding. gray. Yeah, but let me just say it's the gray, a Burtek, the, the little cans. We have three that we use for uh, leaves and stuff like that or just trash. So I'm, I'm asking, I have four, one, three of the little ones, and then one of the big which is the uh, recycling. Sure. So, so what so, are we actually having given to each of the normal residents? Yeah, so uh, it, we are uniforming our, our trash bin. So the way it works right now is you're provided a recycling bin, and then when you establish service in Rancho Mirage, 
you go down to the local hardware store and you get your own trash bins and uh, they're the 32 gallon, they have to have a lid, they have to have handles, they have to have wheels. So okay. the new program will give you a new trash bin. So okay. I, I believe what you're asking is right now we can have multiple 32 gallon trash cans. And you can have three, when, yeah. Yeah, when, when we get the new trash bins, I think what you're trying to ask is, are people gonna be allowed to still have multiple trash bins? So I don't know if Tiana or Frank Either of you want to take that question? Yes, this is Tiana. So Charlie, yes, you will still, you are able to have multiple trash bins. You're able to have multiple recycle bins and you're also able to have multiple green organic waste bins. So if one doesn't suit your needs, you can have up to four included in the monthly rate. Oh, very good. Four total bins? Yeah. Yes. Four, four of each. Four of each. What? You can have as many trash bins as you want, Charlie. <laughs> Are you serious? No. Well, because now we're cut off at, you know, they only pick up three of the small ones and the recycled, and that's it. If you had a fourth little one, they won't take it. Well, the rate, the, if I can interject here, the rates will be structured a little bit differently to where if the 35-gallon doesn't meet the customer's needs, we'll also be able to go to a 64-gallon, which is almost double that size. Um, if they want, if they want multiple, uh, the, uh, right now at 35 gallons times three, <clears throat> excuse me, you have, three, you have 105 gallons worth of um, cans, if you will, to be able to put your product in. So if you go to the, if you go to 364, that dumps it, that jumps it up to uh, 192. And if you want, a, it, it, and it will cost. Okay, you're cutting out. Frank, we lost you. Go back. Oh, sorry. Where did you where did you where did you lose me at? When you were saying how many sixty uh, fours? So if you, if a customer decided to say well, you know the thirty five is too small for me, I'd want three sixty fours. You'd be able to get that, uh, which would give you one hundred and ninety two gallons worth of capacity. So you can you can get larger containers if you want. You can you can get uh, multiple smaller containers. Um, I mean there, there'll be an extra cost for multiple containers and for the larger containers, but it'll be nominal really very good <laughs> yeah and, and really the point of all this the point of the additional organics recycling is to continue to try to divert from our landfills uh, yeah and so that's really the state's goal here is to uh, really uh, reduce what is ending up in our local landfills and try to recycle more which is why they're now adding organics into the residential rate and so as we mentioned, you know, this is kind of step one for the city is let's build in the cost of these capital components. And then obviously uh, we'll have a big public communication push both from uh, Burtec and the city uh, to really inform the public. And as Frank mentioned, that's definitely the more challenging part of this is gonna be that public education piece. Uh, but. The, the good news about it is from a customer standpoint, you know, they're still having their twice a week walk-in service. And really at the end of the day, you're, you're getting an organic spin, which is gonna be green, which you haven't had before. Uh, and really everything else is pretty much the same, only you won't have to go get your own bins anymore. Uh, and you're gonna be provided the bins from Burtec uh, to uniform that process per the state requirements. Can you use the organic waste bin for something other than organic waste if you need it and assuming you don't have any organic waste? No. So, so it's it, only... Just like your recycling bin, uh, you wouldn't put non-recyclables in a recycling bin, uh, which is why there's the flexibility on the trash bin side. So, you know, depending on the unique circumstance, if uh, someone may only need one trash bin, uh, another customer may need multiple trash bins depending on their circumstance, uh, but you definitely do not pollute the other trash bins with trash. Uh, so mm -hmm. just like we don't do that now for recycling, you wouldn't do that for the organics, which is why there's the flexibility on the customer side to one, get additional trash bins that are 35 gallon or get one trash bin that is a 64 gallon or get multiples of those. So it's really uh, provides the most flexibility to the customer, but at no point should anyone put uh, any trash in an organics bin or a recycling bin. And again, organic refers to like watermelon rinds, 
lettuce, that type grass, of stuff. Correct? Correct? What? Yes. So food scraps yeah. and uh, yard clippings. So those oh, okay. weeds that you're talking about earlier. All right. Thank you. Right. Right. Can you discuss those units in Rancho Mirage that have their trash bins built in to the garage? Like Morningside in the Springs? Yes. Yeah, those are the two so main communities that obviously we're going to work with uh, as we transition through this process. But at the end of the day, it's a state requirement. So uh, if a customer has to store their organics bin, as an example, or one of their trash bins somewhere else, you know, that's something that they're going to have to do. Okay, but we would work with Burtec and the homeowners to work out some deal that's good for everybody. Yeah, so obviously, uh, you know, the public education side of this is, is going to be the part that we focus on. Uh, so this is really just step one. So it's still over, you know, uh, this isn't until next year. Um, so we will heavily communicate with our community. And the advantage is, you know, we know where maybe those tough points are going to be. And those two communities that you mentioned, you know, they'll have to communicate out with their households as well. So. Okay, good. Okay, I have one question. I actually two questions. Uh, this is Iris. And hello to you, Frank, and hello to Zoila. Uh, please give her our regards also. And the one question is, this is going to be statewide standardized. Uh, trash pickup or containers, or is it going to vary from city to city as far as pickup? Uh, and, and the containers will be standardized so yeah, yes, I think. Uh, oh, so go ahead. I was just going to say the colors are standardized. Yeah. The types of containers throughout the throughout the different cities will be different, and Rancho Mirage is always going to be unique to the majority of the cities in the in the state. Okay. So now we have our trash picked up one day a week. Is that going to change? And do we have to put in a special request to have it increased to two days a week? Or do we even need to have two days a week? Because what we have now, one day a week, seems to be adequate. Yes, you, 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 not, for, not for us. Yeah, you 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 you're, you can tailor it to your your needs. You don't need to go two days a week. You can keep one day a week, or you can switch to two days a week, um, whichever you prefer. You have the option as you do now. Your the the residents' flexibility and customization does not change. It's going to be exactly the same that it is today. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, so, so this won't impact the type of service that we provide. This is really just standardizing the bin, and yeah. it'll be uniform across the state, which was kind of the point of it of saying, hey, let's make these colors all the same so people immediately identify what goes where. Um, so, you know, most communities don't offer the walk-in service like Ranch Mirage does. So from a service standpoint, the customer is still going to be able to have some flexibility on the number of bins, um, you know, one day a week, twice, week. two times a week. Uh, so the service is still going to be uh, very comparable to what we have now. Uh, the change will be the getting provided uniform trash bins and then the extra organics. And, you know, along with that, just like when we did recycling, when uh, recycling was new, there was a big public education push to say what is recycling and what's appropriate. And, uh, you know, you're going to have to do the same thing for organics because it's a new topic for people. Yeah. Okay. And one additional question then. When we talk about recycles, what is the issue now as far as styrofoam? I know that there's a big issue that came about uh, a couple of years ago that certain styrofoams, if they had a number six on them, were acceptable. Sometimes those were not acceptable, and it seemed to be a little bit of haziness in that defi definition. Uh, this is Frank. Uh, uh, I am I'm losing juice on my computer, so I may drop off. But you can put all the styrofoam you want in your recycling container, and we can recycle it. Not a problem. Okay, great. Thank you. No more questions for me. I'm done. Okay, if there's uh, no more questions or comments from the council, uh, it's time for a motion. Okay. 
Uh, I will make the motion then that the City Council uh, adopt resolution number 2020, next in order, establishing solid waste and recycling collection and disposal rates for all classes of customers within the jurisdiction of the City of Rancho Mirage, effective July 1st, 2020. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Christy, would you please do the roll call vote? Council Member Kite? Yes. Council Member Smotrich? Yes. Council Member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5 0. All right, thank you. I say, uh, can I just recommend that for those big developments out there like Morningside in the Springs, we try and set up HOA meetings as soon as we can to, uh, there's a lot of people that live out there. Yeah, so that's definitely on our list uh, for sure. So yes. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Frank, for uh, being here for the meeting. Thank you, Tiana, for the staff report. Great work on all that. I know this was um, seemed like a pretty um, straightforward addition, but there was a lot that is going on behind the scenes to comply with this new state law. So I would really like to just acknowledge the work put in uh, by Tiana and by Burtek uh, for making this happen in a way that uh, will be successful for our community. All right, let's move on to the next public hearing. Uh, this is a uh, resolution adopting the vehicle miles traveled threshold for the purpose of analyzing uh, transportation impacts under CEQA. And this item will be handled by Jeremy Gleim, our Development Services Director. Jeremy. Thank you, Isaiah, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. This is a very technical document, so I'll do my best to uh, distill it down to its most salient points for you. I'm not going to get into the intimate details of the policy, rather provide an overview of why we're doing what we're doing and why it's up for consideration at this point. So back in 2013, the state passed Senate Bill 743. The purpose of that Senate bill was twofold. Uh, first, to balance traffic congestion management with statewide goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, promote infill development, and promote public health through active transportation. And number two was to ensure that the environmental impacts of traffic, such as noise, air pollution, and safety, continue to be addressed and mitigated through the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. So what does that mean for us? What is changing? Uh, the metric by which traffic is analyzed is changing. Until now, the metric used to analyze traffic impacts has been LOS, or level of service, which was rooted in traffic congestion and delay. It was a way to measure a project's impact to drivers. In other words, how will a specific project affect a driver's ability to move through the street network? That mindset has changed at the state level. And pursuant to Senate Bill 743, a project's effect on automobile delay otherwise known as level of service, shall not constitute a significant environmental impact under CEQA anymore. VMT, or vehicle miles traveled, is now considered the most appropriate measure of transportation impacts on the environment. The major difference between LOS and VMT is that VMT measures the impacts of driving rather than the impacts to drivers. So, VMT measures the overall level of automobile use. A real world example of this uh, can be defined as follows. Let's say you have a large grocery store that is constructed 10 miles outside of a city and is not served by public transportation. Since this project would not aid in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, does not promote infill development, and does not promote public health through active transportation, it would receive a very high VMT number as it would rely almost exclusively on automobile use to get there. Now, if you place that same exact project in the middle of a city where you do have access to public transportation, bicycle lanes and sidewalks, the project would have a very low VMT number because there is less reliance on automobile travel, thereby achieving the statewide goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, promote infill development, and promote public health through active transportation. So that is a very basic overview of VMT. Um, why is it critical that we adopt the policy right now? 
Pursuant to adopted CEQA guidelines in conjunction with Senate Bill 743, a lead agency, which would be Rancho Mirage in our case, could have adopted the state mandated provisions immediately upon their release in 2019, but no later than July 1, 2020. We will be required to implement the state's new VMT policies starting July 1st. However, jurisdictions were provided an opportunity to adopt their own policies rather than being lumped in with the state so that they could be catered to individual communities. And that is the purpose of the resolution before you today. Some benefits of adopting a local policy are, well, the biggest benefit is that we can adjust and massage the policy over time as we begin to truly understand the impacts of VMT so that we can maintain the characteristics and land use pattern of our city. If we do not have a local policy, we will simply be ruled by whatever the state deems most appropriate, which could lead to in inconsistencies with our general plan and the vision for our city. Another benefit is to the development community itself. Having a standalone policy that clearly explains what type of transportation analysis will be required for any given project will take the guesswork out of sifting through state recommendations that may not even be applicable here in Rancho Mirage. And lastly, having a formal policy to work from will allow us to start developing baseline numbers for citywide implementation of VMT analysis. So again, that was just a brief overview of the changes that have been made at the state level, how we have responded to them, and some of the benefits that can be realized by adopting a local policy. Um, this is a state requirement, so we have to comply one way or the other. Um, it just seemed prudent to have a, a local policy on hand that we could cater to our, um, our needs and the needs of the city. So with that, staff recommends that the City Council adopt the transportation analysis policy pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act and Senate Bill 743. That concludes my presentation, and Jesse Eckenroth would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, before we uh, go to questions from council members, this is a public hearing, so I'll go ahead and open up the public hearing now. Uh, this is an opportunity for any member of the public to speak on this item. If you would like to speak on this item and you're on the telephone, uh, you may do so now by pressing star nine on your telephone. Once again, that's star nine on your telephone. Uh, we'll go to uh, those here in person. Uh, is there anyone here in person that would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, we will return to the telephone. And again, you would press star nine now if you would like to speak on this item. Okay, seeing no one on the telephone either, we will uh, close the public hearing and I'll turn this over to the council for any comments, questions, or motion. Hi, Dan, Dan, I have a question. This is Charlie. Does this mean that when we do this, we are on our stand alone and we can be not tied in with anything that the state wants to do in the future? So basically what this means is that we can develop our own policy, our own thresholds that are guided by the state's policies. So the state still has the overarching goals that we have to um, try to achieve through our policy, but yeah. it allows us to be free to make tweaks over time to our own policy. Very good, very good, thank you. Jeremy, what would be the ultimate positive result from this program if it were fully implemented by our city? So the best possible result from, from adopting our own policy is that we can, we can make sure that it's consistent with our general plan and the vision for the long-term growth of the city and, and really cater it to the needs of the city rather than just being guided by the state, which has uh, really no no concern about our individual city. You have a best guess for the total number of units that this would impact? So any new project that is subject to CEQA would be required to conduct this type of analysis, this, um, the, the VMT analysis. Okay. I have a question if I can. Um, take the project going on in section 30, one is it 31 yes well, yeah the project going on there how will that project or how could it 
be negative, negatively impacted uh, by this new uh, st standard or approach. So any project that develops in Section 31, since there's an approved environmental impact report, um, that analysis has already been done. If they were doing a project that was outside the bounds of the specific plan that you approved and the EIR, then they would have to analyze VMT. But in a project like that, VMT numbers would be very low because there are opportunities for multiple trips in a single, um, well, multiple different visits or land uses or um, um, stops for lack of a better term, on a single trip. So a person visiting the site could visit multiple stores or a residence or whatnot. So the VMT numbers would be very low. Uh, the other question I have is if you go to page, uh, well, it doesn't have a page, but about three pages forward, four pages, five pages forward. Section four, transportation projects that do not increase VMT. Yeah, so the state had a list of projects that they considered um, projects that don't increase VMT and could be... They let, me, let, me, let me give you the question I had and then put all of that into the context of the question, if sure. you would. Uh, the, under the first uh, paragraph, indented paragraph, rehabilitation, maintenance, replacement, repair, da 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 it says down at the last part of that sentence, and assets that serve bicycle and pedestrian facilities and that do not add additional motor vehicle lanes. Uh, is there anything in this that you've seen that could impact uh, the status, our status, with respect to CV Link? Uh, I guess that's the end of the question. Is there anything that <clears throat> could impact it? So, I, so we had our city attorney look into that issue, and the answer is no. Oh, great. Okay, um, um, I don't have any other questions. Uh, this is Ted. You know, we discussed this uh, policy quite extensively at the RCTC meeting, and RCTC elected not to send it on at this time to the governor for approval. And what Jeremy is proposing here is, of course, is to give our city uh, the maximum amount of flexibility uh, when dealing with Senate Bill 743. This is another example of where the state is trying to usurp the ability of cities to do their own planning. So it's extremely important that we maintain as much flexibility as possible. And essentially that's the reason that we're being asked today to adopt this resolution is to still give us that latitude and not be totally dependent upon the state. Now the state still has the final call but this this gives planning the opportunity to do a lot more. And so that's why it's so critical for us to adopt uh, this resolution. Well, I'm, I, I have no objection to it, but when I saw that paragraph <clears throat> respecting bicycles uh, in the VHT discussion, it uh, sent a little bit of shivers down my spine. <laughs> it was a good catch, Dana. Thank you. Okay, and I have a question also, um, I believe for Jeremy. First of all, I want to thank you, Jeremy, for putting all of this in layman's terms where the public could really understand exactly what this is about because there is a lot of technical stuff, jargon in this uh, that is really difficult to weave through. But on page 6-3, the last sentence uh, under mitigation, it says, given the jurisdiction's rural sub slash suburban land use context, the following key strategies were identified as the most appropriate. And on the next page, 
It lists uh, several things, six of them. Uh, number one, diversifying land use, uh, Im improving pedestrian networks, implementing traffic calming infrastructure, building low street bicycle network improvements, encouraging telecommunicating and alternative work schedules, providing ride share programs. Perhaps you can just explain a little bit more in detail things like uh, building low street bicycle network improvements and exactly when this is finished, how may this finding of this analysis change how our traffic will flow or will there be a need to implement new transportation opportunities and will more people be encouraged to take buses or do ride shares? Is this part of the ultimate goal? Sure. So those mitigation strategies are just uh, a few of many strategies that could be implemented to reduce VMT. So if, for instance, we were analyzing a project and it was determined that their VMT numbers were a bit high, um, they could choose to implement some of those strategies, one or more of them, to reduce the VMT numbers, and that's just one of many tools that they could use. Um, and the ultimate goal for VMT is to reduce the number of vehicle uh, number of vehicle miles traveled. So it's basically a, a way to diversify land uses. That's the state's goals to diversify land uses so that people have more of an opportunity to use public transportation, bicycles, or just simply walk around to the various services rather than relying so heavily on vehicles. Um, and then also in conjunction with the goals and policies that we have in our, in our general plan, we still have goals and policies that we want to maintain uh, you know, a, a free flowing traffic network so that there's not congestion and delay. So those things are not gonna be inhibited in our city, we will still strive to, to keep a, a traffic network that moves very efficiently. And we really do so. And when, even as you travel down 111, it, it is amazing how fast the traffic flows. But on this one item where it says implementing traffic calming infrastructure, how is that something that we would need to implement or are we in a satisfactory condition as is? Well, so those are just some examples of what could be used as a mitigation measure for a future project. So right now, um, in, in the coming weeks or months, we will start to run some VMT analysis so that we can get some baseline numbers to see where we're at citywide. But as of right now, these are not things that we have to do immediately. These are just things that future project applicants could use as mitigations for their projects. Okay, great, thank you. That's all from me. I'm done. Okay. I'm if there, done. If there's no other uh, questions or comments from the council, now would be the time for a motion. I'll make a motion that the city council adopt resolution number 2020 next in order, adopting vehicle miles traveled, three fresh thresholds of significance for purpose of analyzing transportation impacts upon the California Environmental Quality Act. And I'll second, I'll second that. that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Christy, will you please do a roll call vote? Yes. Council Member Kite? Yes. Council Member Smotrich? Yes. Council Member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. All right, thank you, Christy. That's the end of our public hearings. We will now move on to the action calendar. Item number seven is the city's fiscal year 2020-2021 budget. And uh, I'll briefly turn this over to uh, Kofi Antebaum, our Director of Administrative Services. Kofi. All right, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Isaiah. Good afternoon, um, Mayor and City Council. Our presentation this afternoon is going to be done by um, Joseph Carpenter, who is the finance manager for our city. And um, before I hand it over to him, I would just want to um, thank Joseph and the entire finance team for the time and efforts that they put into 
um, getting this budget together. So, um, Joseph, thank you, and um, you can take it over from here. Thank you, Kofi. Uh, before I begin, I would just like to take a second to thank the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget subcommittee, the city manager, the director of administrative services, and our finance staff. A tremendous amount of time was dedicated to this budget process, and it wouldn't have been possible without everyone's support. Uh, Mr. Kofi Antebaum presented the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget as a discussion item at the June 4th City Council meeting. No revisions have been made to the proposed budget since that meeting, and today's presentation will cover much of the same information. However, today's item requests that City Council approve and adopt the budget. If you could open up the PowerPoint, please. Our presentation today will focus solely on the general fund. The city's special revenue funds were not significantly impacted by COVID-19 as they have unique revenue sources that have been largely unaffected by the pandemic to date. The city council tentatively approved, subject to review, the fiscal year 2020 budget on June 6, 2019. In late March, at the direction of the city manager, the finance division and the director of administrative services started preparing bi-weekly draft budgets for review by the executive management team. As the national, state, and county estimates on the impact of COVID-19 changed, so did each draft budget. In fact, staff expects the budget you are considering today will need to be modified during the fiscal year to incorporate the latest estimates on the recovery from the pandemic because what is known today will change in the future. The city manager and his executive management team performed a line-by-line -line review of all budgeted revenues and expenditures. The proposed adjustments were discussed in detail with the fiscal year 2020-2021 budget subcommittee, consisting of Mayor Hobart and Councilmember Kite on May 28th. As detailed in the staff report and its attachments, staff is proposing to decrease general fund operating revenue, approximately $3.3 million, and operating expenditures, approximately $1.7 million, for a proposed operating deficit of approximately 1.1 million. Additionally, staff is proposing to increase non-operating revenue, approximately 1.9 million, and increase non-operating expenditures, approximately 3.9 million, for a proposed non-operating deficit of approximately 2.8 million. Significant capital projects for the fiscal year include the Frank Sinatra Bridge Project, the Section 31 Water Recycling Facility, and seismic retrofit building improvements at fire station number 50 on highway 111. When combined, the operating and non-operating deficits of the general fund total just under $4 million. The general fund's 30 plus operating revenue sources have been grouped into the major categories shown on the pie chart on slide three. As previously mentioned, staff is proposing to decrease general fund operating revenue approximately $3.3 million or 11.71%. Almost all of this decrease was caused by a 30% reduction in transient occupancy tax, also known as a bed tax, and a 7% decrease in sales tax. The city, like the entire Coachella Valley, is heavily reliant on tourism, which is why this pandemic has impacted operating revenue so significantly. Bed tax and sales tax have contributed more than 50% of budgeted revenues for the past five years. However, this year, staff is proposing to decrease these two revenue sources, approximately 3.1 million or 20.7%, dropping its share of budgeted revenue to 47.5%. The pie chart on slide four shows how the general fund operating expenditures are budgeted. Substantial reductions were made to the budgets of meetings, travel and training, programming, special contributions and funding, professional technical, reimbursements and rebates, and operating transfers. Although expenditures have been reduced a little over $2 million, some expenditures increased, causing a net reduction of approximately 1.7 million, or 6.34%. The largest operating expense of the general fund is public safety, which comprises 46% of the budget for fiscal year 2020-2021, compared to 41% for the prior fiscal year. When reviewing and preparing this budget, staff accounted for a 7% increase in the cost of shared services and a 3% increase in the cost of fire services. 
These increases were based on estimates provided by the Riverside County Sheriff and Cal Fire. The increase of approximately $900,000 to public safety was required to maintain the existing level of service. Significant annual increases like this, just to maintain the same level of service, are not sustainable, which is one of the reasons the City Council created the Public Safety Reserve, which I'll discuss on the next slide. At the end of fiscal year 2018-2019, the city had approximately $72.4 million in its reserves. Staff estimates the city will need to utilize about $6.7 million in reserves during the current fiscal year, leaving an estimated $65.6 million in reserves to start fiscal year 2020-2021. As was discussed earlier in this presentation, it is estimated the city will experience a deficit of approximately $3.95 million in fiscal year 2020-2021. This deficit will be funded by using unassigned fund balance, which is money that hasn't been committed for specific use and is available for any purpose. The capital improvement reserve, which is for land, equipment, replacement, information technology equipment and software, and facility and infrastructure renovations and upgrades. The economic development reserve, which is used to continue the city's economic development efforts, and the public safety reserve, which is for police, fire, and medical services and capital needs. The city's other reserve accounts include the prudent reserve, the disaster recovery reserve, which is used to cover costs and losses associated with disasters that require activation of the city's emergency operating center, and the library reserve. It is estimated the city will use approximately $10.7 million in reserves over the course of fiscal years 2019-2020 and 2020-2021. It is through the city council's thoughtful leadership and their commitment to financial stability that the city has the reserves to preserve, persevere through times such as these. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time and consideration this afternoon. Staff is available to answer any questions. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, before we move to questions and comments from the council, let's go ahead and open up the public comment on this item. Uh, so if you are participating on the phone and you would like to make a public comment on the budget, you may do so now by pressing star nine on your telephone. Once again, that's star nine on your telephone and we'll move to those that are here in person. Is there anyone that would like to make a comment on this item? Uh, seeing no one here in person, let's return to the telephone. Uh, seeing no one on the telephone, we'll go ahead and close the public comment period on this item, and I will move it back to the council for questions, comments. Well, I think uh, that the wonderful, wonderful job was done by everybody on the subcommittee and, and the staff, and we should be very proud that we stand head and shoulders above the other cities in the Coachella Valley. And with that, if you wish, I will make the motion. If anybody else has anything to say before I do that. Well, I'll just comment that, uh, Charlie, that uh, obviously I concur with your, with your comments. I think it's a, a remarkable uh, achievement to be able to make the adjustments that we're doing, cut the areas that we feel are necessary, uh, not diminish services to our residents, and still maintain an estimated fund balance, uh, reserve balance of uh, 61.7 million. I think that's a remarkable achievement. And so my congratulations to everybody that uh, contributed to, uh, to that analysis. I concur. Any other comments before I make the motion? I would just say that some of the people who contributed to this situation, as Ted just mentioned, are people who were on the council about eight years ago when we passed a new and different kind of budget yeah. that changed the deficit uh, type of life we've been living. Yeah, and you were a great part of that, Dana. Um, I, there were a lot of us involved in that. Yeah. Very good. Now, with that, I will say that the City Council of the City of Rancho Mirage and the Board of Directors for the City of Rancho Mirage Housing Authority, Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory, and the City of Rancho Mirage's Community Service District adopt 
The resolutions identified as resolutions A through G, I will read them, A, resolution number 2020, next in order, approving adopting the city's fiscal year 2020-21 budget, B, resolution number 2020, LB, next in order, approving and adopting the library and observer to fiscal year 2020-21 budget, C, resolution number 2020, HA, next in order, Approving and adopting the City of Ranch and Rajas Housing Authority's Fiscal Year 2020-21 Budget, D. Resolution number 2020-HA, next in order, adopting and approving a schedule of reimbursements for city staff time to be paid to the City of Ranch and Mirage for Fiscal Year 2020-21, E. Resolution number 2020-CST, next in order, Approving and adopting the Ranch and Mirage Community Services District Fiscal Year 2020-21 Budget F. Resolution number 2020, next in order, adopting and approving a reimbursement schedule of the city staff services subject to payment by designated special funds for fiscal year 2020-21 MG. Resolution number 2020, next in order, approving the fiscal year 2020-21 salary schedule to comply with California Public Employees Retirement System, CalPERS, statutory and regulatory requirements for compensation enabling and publicly available for pay schedules. I'll, I'll second, second that. that. Good job, Charlie. Hey, Thank hey, you. Charlie, you <laughs> cut out. Can you do that again? Yes, you will. <laughs> Wait a minute. I have a drink or something. Better than that, Charlie. <laughs> Better than that, Charlie. Can can we rent you out? <laughs> All right, Christy. Thank you, everybody. We have a motion and a second. Can you do the roll call vote? Council Member Kite? Yes. Council Member Smotrich? Yes. Council Member Townsend? I think so after that. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, Christy. We'll move on to uh, item number eight on our agenda, and that is the annual appointment of city council representatives to various outside agencies, boards, committees, and commissions. And uh, Christy, you're gonna be handling this presentation? Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, mayor and council members. Annually, following the rotation of mayor, the city council appoints representatives from its membership to serve on various outside agency boards, committees, and commissions. The staff report you received included a list of proposed outside agency appointments for your consideration. The appointments to these positions become effective upon approval. And that completes my brief report and I'm here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Christy. Uh, before we go to the council, I'll go ahead and open up the public comment on this item. Uh, if you're on the telephone and you would like to speak on this item, you may do so now by pressing star nine on your telephone. Uh, we'll move to the audience uh, for those that are here in person. Seeing nobody that wants to speak on this item, we will return to the telephone. Again, you would press star nine now if you'd like to speak on this item. Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll close the public comment period and I'll turn it over to the council. I'll make a motion that the city council confirm the annual appointments of city council representatives to various outside agency boards, committees, and commissions. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Christy, will you please do the roll call vote? Council Member Kite? Yes. Council Member Smotrich? Yes. Council Member Townsend? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Weil? Yes. Mayor Hobart? Yes. The motion carries 5 0. Thank you, Christy. We'll move on to item number nine on the agenda, which is our uh, coronavirus update. Uh, so I'll start uh, this presentation. Uh, so staff hasn't identified any uh, necessary actions for the council to take uh, at this point. So this is um, more of just an update. We, uh, the state of California, the uh, California Department of Public Health uh, did issue a statewide order for face coverings today. Uh, so here in Rancho Mirage, uh, the council approved uh, uh, requirement for face coverings. Uh, the order that was issued today by the state uh, pretty much is in line with what the city council adopted. So when it comes to Rancho Mirage, 
it's pretty much business as usual uh, since the council did enact that order already. Uh, what this does, uh, the, the nice thing about this is even here in the Coachella Valley, when it came to face coverings, there were different rules in different cities. Um, and so what the state of California, part of what they wanted to accomplish was uh, more uniform uh, standards for the state so that you don't have to guess when you're going from city to city what the rules are for face coverings. In addition, the state just recognizes that, uh, you know, part of the science on how we can help prevent the spread of uh, COVID is with face coverings. And so what uh, the state's order does and uh, city staff is uh, going to be posting the state order on our website. Uh, so this information will be available to the public as well, but it requires uh, face covering anytime you're indoors, uh, just like our order. And then there's also, um, if you are outside and you cannot, you're, you're in a outdoor area, public area, uh, where you cannot socially distance yourself from somebody else, then you should also wear a face covering. So when you're in a public area and you're outside and for whatever reason you cannot socially distance, then you should put your face covering on. And then also when you are uh, waiting at a bus stop or any other public transportation site, uh, even if that site is outside, uh, you would be required to wear a face covering. Anytime you're traveling, in public transportation, so you're on a bus, a train, a taxi, a ride share company uh, like uh, Uber or Lyft, uh, you are required to wear your face covering. Uh, and so this is much uh, of the same for us here in Rancho Mirage, but uh, this order is applicable statewide and it kind of uniforms the rules for everybody. So uh, now there's no longer that community to community variance. Uh, there, there are just a couple of nice reminders that uh, are in this order that I'm just gonna point out a, a couple of them. Uh, so they have some exemptions to the face covering uh, rules. Uh, one of those exemptions is for children. And so the order says uh, basically if they're two years or under, they should not wear a face covering because of potential suffocation. And so, uh, you know, when we're out in the public and, and, and you see kids, uh, there is an exemption for kids, uh, younger ch kids that are uh, two and, and younger. Uh, also, uh, I recently participated on uh, the chamber uh, town hall update. And uh, something that I think we all need to keep in mind is uh, the hearing impaired. And uh, these face coverings uh, make it impossible to read lips. And so we do have those in our community that are hearing impaired they are exempted from wearing a face covering. And then also if you're uh, assisting uh, a person that is hearing impaired, uh, you should take off your mask as well. And that is also permitted uh, under these rules so that they can read your lips uh, uh, at the same time. Um, you know, here what we do at the city is obviously uh, the, the council meetings, we are all wearing face coverings. If uh, someone that is hearing impaired comes and is in person, uh, we can give them a device uh, that will close caption uh, everything that we're saying live. Uh, so it's a little tablet uh, where as we're talking, it'll start to uh, show up in writing so that they can follow along with us. And then also when we uh, reproduce our council meetings, we also add the closed captioning uh, on the, the video reproduction as well. Uh, so I think it's important kind of as uh, we're out in the public and uh, dealing with different people that we do keep in mind that there are those that are hearing impaired that may not be wearing a mask themselves and may ask uh, somebody else to uh, take off their mask uh, while they uh, get what they need. So this state order uh, will be on the city's website uh, so that everyone can see it. Again, uh, very consistent with what the order was already for Rancho Mirage. So not much of a change for our community. And uh, uh, Isaiah, what's yeah. the ruling again on groups? Say that again? What's the ruling again on groups? Like 10 or more, 10 or space, less? They gotta space themselves and wear masks. Yes. 
So, so still no uh, change to uh, um, gatherings. Uh, so as, we, as the state has started to open up more of the economy and more businesses are allowed to operate, uh, everyone has uh, safety guidelines and modifications uh, that they have to follow. Uh, this order that I'm talking about now is really just uniforming the uh, requirement for face coverings when you're indoors or you're in a public space outdoors that doesn't allow for social distancing. Uh, guys, let me just give you a, an update on what just happened today here. I belong and Robert belong to EOS Gym in Palm Springs, where we take aerobics classes and Pilates, and they have several classes that they hold in small workout rooms. And the gym said we are now opening up the classes for 18 people, including the instructors, and no masks are required. Now figure that one out. And no what are required? No, no masks are required. So, so you have 18 people plus an instructor in a workout room, a small room closed up with 18 people, elderly people with no masks. And I can't believe that anybody in their right mind would do this. But this is what's happening here with do you wear the mask or don't. And, and the bad signal is being sent that nobody knows what we're doing or there's so many different conflicts of do you or do you not. But to have a gym set this out where one person out of 18 in that room huffing and puffing and jumping around doing exercises, all they have to do is cough, and that whole room and that gym will be closed down. So I don't, I don't know what people are thinking or who's doing what. Uh, if they're, they're that anxious to make money at the expense of people catching this, being sick, or even dying. But this it's, was the day. It's probably going to be closed down anyway, Charlie. Boy, I, Richard, I'm telling you, we're just absolutely floored with this. Floored. That's a horrible story. That it's just terrible. Terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. Either dumb people are. I know. Or, or how uncaring they are about others. Okay. It's, well, if I can add my two cents also. What? Because on the other extreme, uh, and I heard on the news last night, and it is now on Google, and I shall read it. Cathedral City Council voted Wednesday, yet meaning yesterday, to extend an emergency order requiring face coverings and social distancing until September 30th. The yeah. order includes fines that range from $100 to $500, depending on how many times a person is found violating the order. Good Amazing. Amazing. That's, that's okay with me. Yeah, now, yeah. Is that something that anyone has heard of any other cities doing, or is that something that the governor is recommending? And how is that going to be, um, as far as mandating face coverings, how is that going to be uh, monitored? And Well, it doesn't affect anybody outside of the city, so none of it means anything to us as far as monitoring it or any aspect of it. It's, it, it's a great thing for the city, and it'll be especially great if the residents obey it. But it has no effect on us or anybody else. Well, my question is, is that something that uh, we would look into in the, any time in the near future or distant future uh, where we are requiring people to wear masks and uh, is, is that something where if, if someone wants to, you know, uh, a, uh, for lack of a better word, um, bring in, in some type of complaint uh, regarding someone? Is that something that will fall at our doorstep? I think our rules that uh, Isaiah just read <coughs> to us, uh, I think our rules are the general standard across the country. I don't think... Um, as well, we know fact, it's in California now, for sure. Yeah, I mean that, that's. I mean that's what it should be. That's exactly what it should be. Is what we're doing. What they're doing, they're going a step further. They're enforcing it, but <clears throat> hopefully we won't have to enforce it. But that is now the rule, the law. Right. Okay. Well, hopefully we will not have to enforce it. 
Yeah, and Iris, on that uh, on that story, the tagline was, "There is no way that they know how they're going to be able to enforce these fines from ten dollars to five hundred dollars." Well, so there, there's the the rub of that. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, it really is. But boy, I'm Police glad that trying, we're doing you know? this. Police are trying. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And thank God for us and the way we are handling Rancho Mirage. Thank and God we, for us, Charlie. You got that right. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, all right, Isaiah. All Go right. ahead, Isaiah. Uh, so, you know, it's a positive step that the state took. Yep. Um, you know, it really was confusing. And uh, sometimes uh, people aren't familiar with the boundaries of one city to another. Uh, so it is nice that there's going to be some uniform guidance out there. Again, in Rancho Mirage, uh, it's very consistent with the order that you put in place already. Uh, yeah. And I think, you know, just uh, hearing from our businesses and monitoring our COVID hotline and our COVID email, uh, people in our community and are, are very conscious of the rules and wearing masks. Uh, since our library has been open, we've had... Uh, just one or two occurrences where somebody didn't have a mask and they were asked to put one on. Um, so we're seeing uh, compliance uh, with the mask uh, or face covering order. Uh, so our community, I think, continues to respond appropriately and I don't see gross violations out there. Um, you know, gyms have a whole set of rules that they're required to follow. And, yeah. Uh, just like restaurants. I know one of the common questions we get with restaurants is what's the proper protocol? So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to wear your face covering uh, inside the restaurant. And then when you get to your table um, and you are socially distanced or you should be socially <laughs> distanced at that table uh, if the restaurant is set up per the guidelines, uh, when you get to your table, you can remove your mask. And then let's say you had to get up from your table and you know go to the restroom or go do something away from your table you're supposed to wear your mask again or when you're exiting you know you're supposed to wear your mask again when you leave your table uh, so i know the gym environment is uh very similar to that where when they do these workout classes it's supposed to be in a space that accommodates social distancing and then uh, once you get to your space in that uh you know workout room yeah. or you're on your machine, then you can remove your mask and do your exercise. And then when you're uh, walking through the gym from one machine to the next, you're supposed to put your face covering back on, uh, much like, uh, uh, you know, the restaurant operation when you leave your table, well, when you leave your workout station or your workout yeah. area. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, um, businesses are uh, complying with those rules uh, and uh, operating safely and, you know, it's really incumbent upon everybody, especially our business community, to operate safely because the better we do at keeping our numbers down, uh, the less of a likelihood of going back to shutting back down certain sectors of our economy. So the more we all do to help each other out, the better off we all are. Uh, by and far, uh, you know, what we see in Rancho Mirage, especially when it comes to face coverings, is uh, a very appropriate response from our community. Uh, the, what's, the, what's the situation with thermometers and temperature? That's part of the testing for the disease. Yeah, so there there are uh, some very high use uh, businesses that are taking temperatures um, of visitors. Uh, so, as an example, uh, the casino in Rancho Mirage, uh, they are taking your temperature uh, before you come in. Uh, businesses, um, employees are wow. taking temperatures that are working in restaurants and things like that, but uh, not the patrons. So it's uh, okay. one of the steps that's outlined in the, in the guidelines, depending on kind of what the use is. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we've uh, talked about the uh, last few wow. meetings about the Great Plates program. Uh, so that program was extended another 30 days. So it is uh, active through July 10th, which was great news for us in our community. Uh, it's uh, the council uh, opted to become the local program administrator for Rancho Mirage. And really that allowed us to run it locally. 
And uh, the motivation behind that was the belief that uh, we could uh, operate uh, the program with a higher level of customer service and quality in the program. And uh, city staff is delivering on that commitment. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Gabe Cotting, our director of marketing for an update on this great program. Thank you, Mr. Hagerman and uh, mayor, city council staff um, for some good news finally. Uh, the Rancho Mirage Great Plates program has been serving meals since Friday the 8th to, uh, to reaffirm we are the only city in the Coachella Valley that's administering this program locally. And uh, as a side note, I went on the, um, the county's website. The Office of Aging is administering the county program-wide, county-wide program. And they referred you, you called the number, they referred you to the website, you go on the website after you find the button. Uh, it then said in, uh, we're stop, they've stopped to accepting applications as of June 15th for a program that doesn't expire until July 10th. So uh, again, thank you for um, agreeing to this program and empowering us to go into our community. So as of June 19th, we've got 203 participants enrolled in the program that local restaurants to date have delivered over 19,000, almost 20,000 meals, and $437,000 has gone to our local restaurants via this program, and the city's cost share after reimbursements of this program is only $27,000. Uh, this program is, uh, is in place through, through July 10th. The county, in our discussions with the county, they have funds to be able to extend this program another 30 days uh, past the July 10th date and has also given us permission to continue to administer it ourselves uh, so there's not a gap in, um, in uh, logistics and delivery and the choosing of our restaurants. They've been very complimentary on how we've been able to run this program. So uh, there's 22 days on the remaining uh, program which will throw another three hundred thousand dollars into the, our economy a local economy and then if it's extended another 30 days through the county uh, that could be anywhere from another 400 or 500 so the total impact of this program could be and should be close to 40 or 50,000 meals and have a economic impact of close to 1.3 or 4 million over the 90-day period which at the end of the day will only cost us our share to administer it about 60 or 70 thousand um, which we had already kind of uh, prepared for. So it's been a fantastic program. Our restaurants have gone above and beyond, and it's really serving the, um, the immediate need in our community. And again, we're, we're the only one doing it in the, uh, in the valley. So uh, pleasure to uh, offer up some good news um, and some hardworking uh, people in our community doing some really good stuff and here to answer any questions. Okay, well, you congratulations. and your staff have done hey, a great job. Great, that's a great accomplishment. Uh, you and your staff should be very proud. Can anybody tell me if there's, do we get reports uh, from that, um, I think it's like an Alzheimer's home down on Peterson Road. I think that has been the site of some deaths or near deaths. <laughs> yes, Dana, yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, I can uh, answer that. Um, the County Public Health Department is the one that works very closely with um, any of the uh, assisted living facilities. And, and really, from the onset of this, uh, that was the most high risk uh, and continues to be one of the most high risk uh, vulnerable populations that we have. Um, so they're all in very close quarters um, and uh, usually have other underlining health conditions that really put them at risk for COVID-19. So, um, you know, part of what we're seeing um, is when these daily numbers come out, I think it was on Tuesday of this week, it was reported that Riverside County had, I think it was about 409 new cases on Tuesday. Um, 160 of those were being driven by the Chuckwalla prison out in Blythe. So in that 409, 160 of those were from a prison. Um, when you look at Rancho Mirage's data, and we have roughly, I think, 75 confirmed cases, uh, the vast majority of those 
um, are stemming from really two assisted living facilities. Uh, so a lot of our numbers are being driven by a very small percentage of the population. So right now, uh, what we're seeing in the Coachella Valley is um, our hospitals are uh, dealing with uh, a pretty big prison outbreak. Um, and then also uh, we are getting some uh, patients transported into the valley from Imperial County. Uh, so Imperial County is really lacking in some, uh, in the necessary healthcare facilities. So those patients are actively being treated in Coachella Valley hospitals. So some of the data that we see coming out of our local hospitals, a, a certain percentage of those patients are stemming from prisons and from Imperial County. You know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, the, the, as the economy opens up and people uh, do more activity, uh, obviously that's naturally gonna lead to, and testing expands, that's naturally gonna lead to increased cases. So it is important to, uh, for all of us to uh, remain diligent. So anytime an assisted living facility uh, encounters an issue, it's a uh, county uh, public health department that they're coordinating with. And county pu public health uh, has a great system in place. Uh, it's already happened a couple times where there was an assisted living facility uh, that just ran out of staff and county public health had to react to that and get those patients into environments where they could be cared for. Uh, so the County Public Health Department takes on those assisted living facilities and really uh, comes in and mass uh, and tests. They can supplement staffing if a large portion of the staff is on quarantine or sick themselves so that care doesn't lapse. And then they also have very strict protocols uh, that those facilities have to follow both with their staff and then really the uh, eliminating any outside visits. Um, so that is a, uh, th those really at risk populations and uh, assisted living facilities have the most stringent requirements and county health uh, has a great process in place to uh, aid those facilities in responding and testing uh, as these outbreaks occur. That's a good report. Thank you for that. Yeah, I wanted to thank you also, Isaiah, for that report and that update because it really is crucial, especially when you consider that Imperial Valley, uh, has, Imperial County has had a huge number of people um, that have been infected. And it does, it does make a difference with the total amount of numbers. And, um, but I wanted to go back to something if nobody else has any other comments because I wanted to go back to the good news in regard to our Great Plates program, and I wanted to ask um, Gabe if the fact that we now have these refrigerated vans that are available to restaurants that are unable to make deliveries, does that make a difference, or has it made a difference in the amount of restaurants that are participating? Yeah, it's and this is a big, big thank you to uh, Jessica Pulliam and, and Haley and then the, uh, the folks that the team of Tyler, Tiana, um, that are manning our COVID hotline. Um, our restaurants have been really, really collaborative and, and doing a great job. So what you'll see is we, we do uh, we do deliveries three times a week. Um, and so you'll see one restaurant that's only doing like breakfast and lunch will deliver to another restaurant that will make all the deliveries. So you've really seen sub, some restaurants like a drink or a pastry swan that have refrigerated trucks or delivery trucks do kind of the, the total deliveries and really collaborate with other restaurants so you can boost the participation. Because some restaurants like a Norma's say, it's really for, difficult for us to do breakfast, um, but what if we did the dinner and then we dropped it off to drink and then drink did the whole delivery of all the meals? Because logistically you're delivering these to people's homes. So this is 200 you know, plus individual homes right to their doorstep. So uh, Jessica has done a great job of breaking these into zones, breaking these into categories. So people get their deliveries at the same time, you know, every week. So logistically, it's not an easy feat. But yeah, the refrigeration, especially in the hot weather, is key. And there have been some of our local restaurants that have those refrigerated mm -hmm. delivery trucks that have stepped up and, and are making deliveries, even if it's they're not their own food. That's fabulous. 
it's just great news all the way around. So thank you, thank you. Gabe, I have one question. The profile of the people getting this service, could you elaborate on that age and, and financial situations, or does it matter? Yeah, tall, dark-haired. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yes, they're they're financial, so they can't they can't make uh, uh, per the requirements right now. There's a, there's a threshold where they yeah. can't make more than they need to be 60 and have an underlying health issue, or 65 and older um, with you know and and at high risk, and and then they can't make 600. Uh, percent times the 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 um, poverty rate, so it puts yeah. them right about, you know, the sixty to seventy thousand um, dollar range. So if they're below that range, and if they live live with, uh, they need to either live alone or live with somebody else that yeah. is also eligible for them to get for them to get the food. So this this hits a lot of our affordable housing yeah. um, residents, and we've called all you know, not just the housing units that properties that the city owns but also the mobile home parks and the other affordable housing units that are not owned by the city or operated by the city and made sure that um, they have the information uh, via flyers, via email, and we've made it really easy. You call the hotline and you, you, you uh, talk with one of our staff and they sign you up over the phone and you're getting delivery within a couple of days. Very good, and uh, that's the way it should be. And the reason I asked this question very quickly, I had a, a phone call from uh, a person that I know and said, how do I get on this great plates thing that I'm hearing about? And this uh, girlfriend called me and told me about it, and we're thinking about it. And I said, well, first of all, are you going to drive your $350,000 Bentley over to pick up the food, or do you want them to bring them to your $5 million home? And that was the end of that. And this is a true story. I'm not kidding. <laughs> true. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. so just, I, I'm telling you, I just almost fell off the chair. But yeah. maybe that's why they're driving a three hundred fifty thousand dollar Bentley. I don't know. The, but it's it's good. The program is wonderful. Yeah, the, the great thing about the program is there's some pretty powerful uh, responses we've gotten. Where you know there's a lot of need out in our community, and uh, those are the people that we're reaching. And part of the reason in the program there's some. Uh, income requirements is, um, you know, there's also other aid programs out there. Uh, yeah. And so they didn't want to duplicate effort uh, with those other aid programs. So that's yeah. really what dictated, you know, kind of the income thresholds. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, the people that we're reaching in our community are uh, the ones that are at very high risk. Um, and uh, it could potentially save them uh, a trip uh, somewhere where they could potentially get exposed. Uh, you know, we've heard from participants yeah. that were just in tears about how thankful they were and how nervous they were going out to get groceries and those sort of things. So uh, the participants in the program uh, have had some pretty powerful um, uh, testimonies and it's been, I know from a staff perspective, and uh, what we hear from our participating restaurants is, uh, you know, it's also a pretty rewarding process to go through and be able to help people during this difficult time. So, and it all kind of started with uh, the council's decision to take on some of the cost responsibility to deliver what uh, I would say is a fantastic program uh, to our community and to our vulnerable population. Well, it's a win-win for everybody, and the, the participation of our dollars is so low to have been so supportive and so rewarding. It's a wonderful. Producing, we get so much is produced from yeah, so little. Yeah, it's amazing. Hey, Iris, doesn't uh, Jocelyn Center still have the meal program over there, too? Oh, yes. There you go. Yes. That's so it. we're pretty well done. Yeah. And if anyone wants to donate... They're, they're always looking for, for uh, additional uh, revenue so that they can provide. Yeah, so we're in a good, good situation with uh, these two programs and these two uh, developments that help so many wonderful people that really deserve it. Yes. Okay, so uh, that's all staff has for you. So uh, before we move on from the item, uh, if any member of the public would like to speak on this item, now is the time to do so. 
you can speak on this item by pressing star nine on your telephone. And uh, we'll move to those that are here in person. Uh, seeing nobody here in person that would like to speak on this item. Uh, we do have one person on the telephone that would like to speak on this item. Uh, and that is Mr. Brad Anderson. Uh, go ahead, we can hear you. Great, thank you, uh, Brad Anderson. I live in the city again. Uh, uh, I just, uh, I think I might have to use my whole three minutes on this. This is a lot of topics to cover, but uh, uh, anyway, I, I just, uh, about the, the funny comment that the city manager said about the prison outbreak. See, I, I caught that, but uh, it, it's been documented that a lot of the inmates apparently uh, self infecting themselves for whatever reasons that's something that should be known but uh and uh and that's a concern but uh i guess uh about the face coverings again i understand that the mandated or order from the uh, state now and uh and, but again there's no no mandates on the construction of such face masks so and and the comment concerning uh deaf people uh I understand, and but uh, who's to say a deaf person is not infected? Uh, so the the common sense around all this stuff is lost, and the science is not there to protect it or to uh, to secure a, a reasonable thought on it anyway. But uh, the comments, I'm, I'm sure I'm stand alone on this, uh, according to the consensus of the counter and the comments today. Uh, I did hear the comment that, that thank God for us. Uh, you know that's just a disappointing statement to hear, and 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 concerning health clubs and and what they're doing and and reporting on other people for not wearing a face mask, as, as, and and possibly finding people in the future. It sounds like uh, with penalties for not doing that. That's just uh, it's just uh, it's just wrong. But. Uh, uh, anyway, that's really all I had to And public health, we're talking about public health and what good service they're doing. I know for a fact that they are they run by the seat of the pants most of the time. They're really they, knowing from the vector district, knowing how they operate, mismanagement. Uh, it's a day-to-day -day operation of how they're going to react to something. So, uh, again, that's my two cents. I hope it's taken by somebody. And, uh, and thank you very much for allowing me to talk. Goodbye. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, seeing no one else that would like to speak on this item, we'll go ahead and close the public comment period. And uh, there's no specific action for the council other than just to receive the update. So before we uh, move on, are there any other comments or questions from council? Nothing from Iris. It was a great meeting. A lot was covered. Okay, great. Uh, so that is our last item on our agenda today. So we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everybody much. for your leadership. Thank you. Bye-bye.